what's the Babylon B? Comedy's changing. A new breed of comedians is challenging the old guard and often winning. The Babylon Bee now reaches more people than the onion. Your word is woman. Can I have the definition, please? They do it with skits like this. Uh, why don't you ask Judge One that question? Can I have the definition of woman, please? No. I did a short video on the bee a few months ago, but that hardly scratched the surface. So here's my full interview with the bees Kyle Mann and Chandler Juliet. What's the Babylon Bee? So the Babylon Bee is a Christian news satire site, which sounds crazy, but it's a thing that we created that actually uh, kind of took off. We launched the Babylon Bee back during the 2016 election, and it was this crazy time where Christians didn't know how to feel about politics. Donald Trump was entering the race, but Christians hated Hillary and didn't know where to go, didn't know who to vote for. So we kind of came into this space where we started doing satirical political commentary and current event commentary from a Christian perspective, but it, it was so different in tone from a lot of the stuff you see coming from uh, leftist outlets or secular outlets. You know, whenever they make fun of Christians or they make fun of conservatives, there's a, a very uh, kind of hateful bent to their satire and their humor, um, as anybody who's turned on any of the late night lecture shows these days knows. Um, and so for us, it was like we're writing comedy that does make fun of Republicans. It does make fun of conservatives. It makes fun of Christians, but it does it in a fun way where we're clearly part of the in group that's mocking uh, the in group pointing within. Conservative Christians are not known for doing comedy skits, making fun of people. Do you get grief when you started over that? Yeah, absolutely. There has been a cultural shift over the past few decades. You know, Christian conservatives kind of used to be the ones who were very dour and self-serious, you know, and now that has really shifted to be the the religious, uh, zealous religious left, you know, that is so, so religious about their beliefs. Um, they're the ones that have trouble laughing at themselves. I think as Christians, we've been the butt of the joke for so long that we've, we've really become numb to it. And, and now we enjoy laughing at ourselves and we enjoy being the butt of the joke and it's important to be able to laugh at yourself and I think that's key to any good comedy so we're really starting to see conservatives and Christians come around in the comedy space. We haven't really had the need to become such a voice in this community until over the last decade or so as things have gotten really extreme in the media and Hollywood that's very left dominated and journalism and media in Hollywood. And now we're tired of being stifled. We're tired of being fact checked. We're tired of waiting for an opportunity to share what we really think. I grew up in Hollywood. I, my parents are in the Hollywood scene and I watched them get discriminated against for their conservative beliefs. And um, it, now we can't wait any longer. We have to create our own platform and that's what we're doing. And we're super happy to be leading the comedic conversation on the right. And that is heck and we're not gonna take it anymore. What's Christian about your humor? Humor has a long history and satire especially has a long history within um, Christian tradition and the Bible. The prophets mercilessly mocked people out in the world who worshiped false gods. Jesus constantly had harsh words for the self-serious, self-religious people of the day. Um, and so I think comedy is and humor are tools that God has given us to expose folly, to expose falsehood, to speak truth to a culture that doesn't believe in truth anymore. The traditional comedy shows have become preachy, smug. It's less funny. Leftists have become so, um, you know, religiously zealous about their beliefs. They start turning comedy into an opportunity to lecture. And we find that comedy is funnier when you just put comedy first, uh, try to write a good joke, and don't worry so much about the point being made. We have a clip of Ellen DeGeneres. Trevor, you call yourself a Cuomosexual, and I I, <laughs> I agree with you. I feel like I'm a Cuomosexual too. Uh, from what I've seen from late night TV shows and, and all of the pretty left-leaning Hollywood media is, is just that, it's lecturing, it's, it's trying to prove something and it's not funny anymore. I hope that's something that we never run into. I think that being funny and calling out life's absurdities and absurdities of human behavior in today's culture should be the goal. And um, that's why we're reaching people. And, and that's what I hope we continue to do. Jimmy Kimmel did, did one, uh, sort of a 
Fauci promotion. Let me tell you, screwball, something about Dr. Fauci, because I've had enough of this, and uh, he's too nice to say this himself. This man has been working on behalf of the public, that's us, for more than 50 years. To suggest Fauci's politics have anything to do with his work is a lie. He worked on all these things, and thank God there's someone who's educated enough and devoted enough to figure this stuff out for us. It's like a lecture. Right, it's not like a lecture. It is a lecture. That's what you see anytime you turn on TV. You know, it's it's they have a point that they really want to hit and they just become that. They really become a parody of themselves at that point. You know, good comedy is going to mock those in power. Good comedy is going to mock cultural institutions that wield great power. It's not going to be, you know, just running defense for the people in power all the time. <laughs> so let's talk about your work, the Beatle parody. Imagine all the people living in the gulags. Imagine all the people living in the gulags. Yeah, I can. imagine there's no money. No money. It isn't hard to do. Not hard to do. Nothing to eat or drink. So we wrote a parody of the song Imagine by John Lennon, where we said, what if, it, you know, because his, his song is kind of supposed to be portraying this communist-ish utopia. And we said, well, what if we actually described what communism is actually like? And so we have, yeah, <laughs> we have lines like, imagine, imagine there's no food, you know, that's, that's a little more accurate. You ran a skit about the woke zone. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension of ever-changing boundaries based on the latest college fad, where every concept of justice is intersectional with terror. This is the woke zone. What do you mean? What's the woke zone? We imagine this series of videos where we do, obviously, a Twilight Zone parody. It does feel that way when you, when you encounter a lot of the woke ideology. Can't you see all this? Can't you see? You mean the fire and the looting? Uh, yeah, the fire and the looting. Oh, sure. I mean, we see it. We're just trying not to focus on a few nonviolent things like the complete and utter desolation of a city. And you go, are we living in an alternate reality right now where, you know, all the gender stuff and all the all the stuff coming down the pike from the far left? It feels like you're in the twilight zone a lot of the time. Trans women should be able to compete in women's sports just like any other women. The first woke zone we did was the kid who insists everybody... Uh, everybody use his pronouns or that he's transgender or something. And then he sends people away into the cornfield if they, uh, <laughs> if they misgender or, or don't agree with his, uh, his beliefs. This is complete insanity. That's transphobic. Phobic, the only one scared of these people. He only has power while you give in. What you're doing isn't tolerance or compassion. It's just cowardice. Speak up. No one likes you. You're a bad man. And that's why you're canceled. Do you ever feel gratitude to the left that they give you so much material? I would say that the reason why the Babylon Bee is exploding in this whole space of comedy on the right is because things have gotten so extreme and so political, especially over the last two years. So I would say yes, because that's given it, it was the it was the final straw that allowed people to be fed up enough to start taking matters into their own hands, making their own content making fun of what we want to make fun of and and it's working really well so i would say yes i am grateful those crazies the left is a double-edged sword though it's a blessing and a curse you know it gives you it's a target rich environment for sure but at the same time we have to write things that are funnier than things they're actually doing and that makes our job very difficult <laughs> A skit about how you can't do satire anymore. Yeah, that was a fun sketch that we that we did where we imagined comedy writers, say at the Babylon Bee, sitting down in a room and trying to uh, trying to come up with jokes, but we keep getting foiled because the Democrats already did it, or uh, you know, people on the right already did it. Was kind of the uh, the running gag there. How can we write satire when so the dumbest thing that we can think of is something the Democrats have already done? John Kerry warns that the war in Ukraine might distract from climate change. He actually did that. CDC says to social distance and fallout shelters. A math professor says that two plus two equals four is racist. Man who destroyed women in sports is celebrated as a hero. It already happened. BLM protesters are nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Happened. Ah. Cosmo magazine features a morbidly obese woman on the cover as the picture of health. Happened. I ah, give up! Satire is impossible! No, no, no! 
all those things really did happen? Yeah, we actually did pull real news stories and then had the comedy writers pretend to pitch them as jokes and be disappointed to find out that, that, that uh, reality already did it. <laughs> a math professor really said saying two plus two equals four is racist? Yes, we had actually written that as a Babylon Bee headline back in 2017. And then there was a math professor on Twitter just a year or two ago that started this conversation about how saying two plus two equals four is a colonialist white supremacist idea. Why? <laughs> 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 That's what I want to know. Um, there's this idea in higher education, you know, that just believing in truth is some kind of white supremacist idea or just having having some kind of um, idea that there's a right answer and a wrong answer. If you have unequal outcomes, you know, then they say, then that must be because the math itself or the subject itself is racist and not looking at all the other contributing factors. Elon Musk, let's talk about him. Are you surprised to find he's a fan? I'm very surprised, very surprised. Um, that That's wild, you know, we were, we were posting jokes, I don't know, a year or two ago and he started replying to them or retweeting them and sharing them. And, uh, and that's crazy, you know, that's something, like I said, we are a small Christian satire site and, uh, and when we launched this thing in 2016, we never expected to get that kind of interaction, for sure. There's a Bloomberg headline that says Elon Musk opined about buying Twitter after you were banned. Yeah, you know, we don't we don't 100 percent know what all the connections there were. You've been locked out of Twitter now for several months for doing what? Yeah, well, Rachel Levine is I don't remember the exact title, deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, if I got that right. Rachel Levine is a transgender individual, presents as a woman, and um, had gotten a Woman of the Year award from USA Today, which named Rachel Levine one of the Women of the Year. So we kind of responded jokingly by, by giving Rachel Levine our Man of the Year award. Twitter says if you admit your mistake and delete your tweet, they'll allow you back. So why don't you? We have to go into our Twitter account and acknowledge that we've committed hateful conduct and click delete on a tweet where it's a joke. It's, you know, to us, it, it's just comedy, but it also is pointing to an underlying truth as a lot of comedy does. And we have to acknowledge that a joke calling a biological male a man is uh, intrinsically hateful conduct before they'll let us on. Twitter has the the capability to just delete the tweet themselves and let us back on and, and say, you know, you have one strike or whatever, but they want us to bend the knee and be the ones to click, yes, we did <laughs> call it hateful conduct, and we're not going to do that. These so-called fact checkers keep fact checking you. Does Snopes, for example, not understand that you're making jokes? I think they know very well what our intentions are as a organization. They just don't like us. So they're going to say that we're an alt-right misinformation site, which is not what we are at all. We're a comedy site. And we made that extremely clear on all our platforms. Did Bernie Sanders vow to round up remaining ISIS members and allow them to vote? Of course, that's a joke. Yeah, it's a real, it's almost a real badge of honor, you know, when you get fact-checked because there's this idea that in our minds, it's like we we wrote a joke that was so close to the target. It was so representative of the group that we're making fun of that people couldn't tell the difference between our satire and something that Bernie Sanders actually said or whatever. Maybe we're running into trouble with because we keep getting things so close to the truth. I cannot wait for five to 10 years. We have like a actually comprehensive list of our prophecies fulfilled. You know how uh, Simpsons will have these little clips that, oh my gosh, the Simpsons predicted the future. As you know, we've inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. It's like they didn't predict the future. They were just on the pulse of the culture and understood exactly what was happening. And that's what we're doing now. And that's why we keep we keep getting it right so much of the time, just months or even days before the actual truth is happening. It kills my reach that Facebook semi bans me because of these idiot fact checkers. How much is this hurting you? We get pretty significantly hurt by it. The, the way that it works is it, it, there's this big tech kind of fact checking cabal where they, um, they will fact check something via Snopes or USA Today or AP. And then Facebook will link to those fact checks automatically. And they have their fact checking partners so then Facebook will start to downrank your page because you've been fact-checked so many times. And it doesn't matter that the USA Today fact-check says, 
oh, this is satire, it's a joke, you know, and 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 does this little uh, debunking of it. Facebook has no way to tell that you're only getting fact checked because some people misunderstood a joke. They think that you're harmfully spreading misinformation. So doesn't that piss you off? It's definitely killed our reach. I, I don't know about the actual analytics of it all, but since we've been off Twitter, I've noticed a little bit of a, a lower reach with our videos, which is most primarily being spread on YouTube. Um, so it is a little disappointing to see because I think we're making some of our best stuff ever. Um, to call back to what you said earlier with the woke zone, it does sometimes feel like we're taking crazy pills. So comedy is kind of like a, a light in the dark with that. We can see what's funny. We can see that we're reaching people. We can see that we have found objective truth. We're not the only people who feel this way. And People can laugh and it breaks up this energy and it lets people's guards down and we can actually change people's minds rather than trying to debate people and where people's defenses are up and all angry and emotional. We can we can laugh together and we can come back together and, and heal from all this. On your Instagram, you call yourself the bees diversity hire. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Actually, you got those words from the Kyle man himself. I, I'm happy to, to sprinkle in some feminine energy and and um, be a part of this incredible thing that's going on. My name is Trucy LaCroix. My pronouns are she slash her, and I'm auditioning for the role of press secretary. You, sir. How does the White House plan to deal with the crisis at the border? Mine? You're bothered by the new pronouns? I will never forget the first time I was uh, I'm a, officially now an ex-musician, maybe not forever, uh, but I was very much involved in the music scene in Los Angeles. And I will never forget the very first time in 2019, I walked into a private concert series that I was performing at and they asked me what my pronouns were. And my exact response was, my pronouns and I was offended. I was like, uh, she, her, I guess. Uh, I just didn't want to be a jerk or anything. If we can change the meanings of the word fish and include bees as fish, and if we can change the meaning of the word man and woman, then everything's going to come apart. So if we can't be on the same plane of reality with each other, we're in trouble. And by the way, I've met people of different backgrounds of trans and gay, and at least we can have a logical discussion and we're on the same plane of reality. That is where it's at for me. If we can agree on logic and reason, then I'm with you. Why is it offensive? They just say it's inclusive, it's kind. I don't think that womanhood should be a costume you should be able to put on. Toxic masculinity is a problem. I believe that men and women are equal. Anything I can do, my wife can do too. The idea that just because I have testosterone, I'm better at things is reductive. And quite frankly, it's insulting. How do you get that tire changed yet? What's your point? Culture loves to kind of crap all over masculinity. You know, we're told that we don't need fathers and we're, to we're told that, um, you know, man and woman are the same and it doesn't matter what the family structure is until the rubber meets the road, you know, until you have a real crisis, until you realize that our, our son, we're failing our sons and daughters, um, until we hit a real crisis, um, you know, if the United States were to get invaded tomorrow, suddenly you wouldn't have any complaints about the toxically masculine males who are taking up arms to defend our country. And so that's kind of the point of that one is, is envisioning a, uh, envisioning a lazy dad who's just citing toxic masculinity concerns to make his wife do all the chores. And uh, just another one. African Americans are being oppressed by horrific new voter laws, forcing them to acquire a legal ID to vote. Excuse me, sir. You're unable to acquire an ID, are you not? Uh, actually, I just renewed my ID. It's pretty easy, actually. There you have it. This poor black man has been disenfranchised by racist voter ID laws. You're making fun of the politicians or the media? Yeah, that comes from a Babylon Bee article we wrote. Democrats shocked and surprised as a black man is able to get an ID. You know, and it's this racism of low expectations. You can't say that, um, oh, you're, you're, you're for equality and you believe the best about black people and then also say they're not able to get an ID. There was like a viral video that was going around of somebody going around and asking um, white people, mostly white liberals, like, do you think black people are going to be able to get an ID? And they're like, no, a lot of them can't, can't figure it out. <laughs> well, I feel like they don't have the knowledge of how, of like how it works. For most of the communities, they don't really know what is out there just because they're not aware or like they're not informed. Then the same person goes and interviews black people. Do you carry ID? Yes, I do. Do you know anybody, who, any black person who doesn't carry ID? No. Why would they think we don't have ID? 
<laughs> that's a lie. And yep. so that's what we're really skewering there is that racism on the left. It really shows who the real racists are. There are more people challenging the, the left trend. It's art. And you're free to interpret this art however you'd like. The old fashioned women. Oh, God. You know, the ones with wombs. People like Dave Chappelle, Ricky Gervais, they're doing really well going in the other direction. The crazy thing about that is they're not they're not expressing opinions that are that would have been that out of step with people on the left just five or 10 years ago. They're just saying common sense things that everybody believed. And all of a sudden that makes them part of the alt-right. <laughs> They'll get called far-right comedians or they're telling transphobic jokes or this or that. When they're just saying very normal, common sense stuff, you know, as you see the Overton window kind of shift, those guys are starting to get left out in the cold. Same with Bill Maher, uh, who's found himself out of touch with the Democratic Party on a lot of issues. Let's get this straight. It's not me who's changed. It's the left. What's interesting about all, all of these comedians and Bill Maher and Dave Chappelle, by the way, I love Dave Chappelle. I love what Ricky Gervais is doing. I just watched his special the other day. And here's the thing. He's only saying common sense things and some things that I don't necessarily agree with. You know, he's an atheist. And I was like, OK, well, I can I can still watch this and enjoy this and discern that I don't agree with everything he says, but still enjoy this for what it is. But it seems as though the left audience is not okay with that. I think it's all of our jobs to speak out about this. It's the lowest form of comedy. It is hack, it is played out, and those were terrible jokes. You can't say this, you can't say that. Trying to take away people's ability to have observations on human behavior. And I think that's why we're seeing this, this shift. The left wants to cancel comedy and take away our right to say things that we're clearly seeing. And um, that's why it's resulting in some friction in the comedy space. Those guys are saying it and they're doing well with it. Yeah, they're doing well with it, you know, because 90 percent of people are, uh, you know, 95 percent, maybe 99 percent of people. I don't want to push it, but agree with what they're saying because it's just normal, common sense stuff. Stuff like Twitter gives you a. Um, a very skewed view of what the average ordinary American believes about this kind of stuff. And you start to think that these fringe positions on the left are normal and mainstream, but they're really not. They're really out of touch and out of step with these very normal positions that these comedians are espousing in their comedy. Comedy traditionally attacks the establishment. And now it's like the left has become the establishment. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny how uh, the left used to be anti-establishment and anti-corporation, and now they've become the blob. They've become the dominant culture. And and I think people on the right have been conditioned to keep their mouths shut and not only in the workplace or in entertainment and media for years and years and years. And, you know, we, we have been a little bit more docile because that's kind of who we are as people. And I think it's cool to see that there's differing personalities within this community that are, are ready to make fun of what's obviously happening in our culture today. I think it was Andrew Doyle who runs the Titania McGrath account on Twitter who once pointed out the absolute humor and absurdity that the left controls every cultural institution in our nation, essentially all the core ones, and yet thinks that they're oppressed. There's no better, uh, space for comedy than making fun of very self-serious people who have a ton of power and think that they're the oppressed ones. How do they think they're oppressed? Well, that's the entire, you know, woke worldview. And I know woke is kind of a buzzword that, that has no meaning anymore, <laughs> but that's kind of the whole worldview is you divide the world into classes of oppressed and oppressors, and you stumble over yourself to show that you're one of the poor oppressed and that you're the good guy fighting the resistance against the evil oppressors. That's the constant drum that they're always beating to show that they're on the right side of history. You've now surpassed The Onion in circulation. I am personally a huge fan of The Onion and everything they've done. And we obviously are standing on their shoulders in a lot of ways because they really popularized the very short headline joke. There were satirical news publications long before The Onion, but the, what they popularized was really distilling your joke down to just that headline. And I really love the dry commentary that they've done. Obviously, we don't agree with them on a lot of things, politics and religion and whatever. But um, but I really appreciate what they've done in that space and how true to their brand that they have stayed throughout the years. And they do even now make fun of both sides. Yeah, they actually do a pretty good job. You know, people will say that the onion has swung hard left and they've gone they've gone far left. And they certainly are on the left. 
But they will also call out their own. They make fun of Biden all the time. They made fun of Obama for his drone wars during uh, during the Obama administration. So they are fairly consistent in that they will mock both sides. Where will this go? Will you replace SNL someday? Will there be a divided comedy world? Yeah, we have a lot of fun projects in the works, and uh, we think the sky's the limit for the formats that we can apply the Babylon Bee sense of humor to. We've had discussions about doing something like Saturday Night Live, and that's the comment that we get on all of our YouTube videos. You know, why don't you guys have your own version of Saturday Night Live? And it's a great question and one that hopefully we can answer soon. <laughs> it feels almost unfortunate that we have to have a divided comedy space. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say that a lot of People, the true comedians appreciate people on all sides of the political spectrum. I hope that we can use comedy to come back together and just be one big happy family again and laugh together at the absurdities of life and human behavior. Um, but right now, it's very clear that um, <laughs> the left has no interest in playing nice with the right. Um, I'd say we're a little bit more open minded than them, which is very interesting that we're the more tolerant side. Um, but ultimately, comedy is something that's going to protect free speech and keep free speech alive and be able to be able to call out objective truths. Thank you. You guys were great. Thank you so hey, much this, for this having was us. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Want to help us out if you like these videos, please share and like it. And if you want to help us make more, click that button.